Okay, folks, we'll go ahead and get started. So hello, everyone, and welcome to the GFI Business of Alt Protein Monthly Seminar. I'm Molly O'Donnell, the Corporate Engagement Coordinator here at the Good Food Institute. I help manage the business side of our GF Ideas community of entrepreneurs, investors, and other professionals in the alt protein industry. You can visit gfi.org slash community to learn more about the community. The Good Food Institute is an international nonprofit organization that is developing the roadmap for a sustainable, secure, and just protein supply. We identify the most effective solutions, mobilize resources and talent, and empower partners across the food system to make alternative proteins accessible, affordable, and delicious. Please visit gfi.org to learn more about our work. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. First, the seminar will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel shortly after the presentation. A copy of the slides and recording will be emailed to registrants after the presentation. You can also view previous seminars on our YouTube channel. Second, this presentation will include an audience Q&A in the last 15 or so minutes. Please ask your questions in the Q&A box rather than the chat, and you're welcome to ask questions throughout the seminar, but we'll save most of them for the end. And now I'm excited to introduce our speakers, Roger Kwan, Jason Novak, Ben Pelletier, and Roger Royce, all partners at Haynes & Boone Law Firm. Haynes & Boone specializes in supporting companies in the tech sector with intellectual property, and they've worked with a number of alternative protein companies to capitalize on their breakthrough technologies. In this presentation, our speakers will walk us through the basics of intellectual property for alternative protein companies, from choosing the right corporate structure, to when to use patents versus trade secrets, to approaching raising capital. I'll now turn it over to you, Roger. Thanks for the great introduction, Molly. Uh, my name is Roger Kwan. I am a partner out of the uh, Haynes & Boone San Francisco office. And um, as Molly alluded to earlier, we're going to be talking about, uh, my colleagues and I are going to be talking about uh, intellectual property and corporate legal considerations within uh, the meat substitutes and no novel proteins industry. For those of you who don't, uh, who aren't familiar with our firm, James and Boone, we're a general practice firm, um, uh, actually a global general practice firm of over 600 attorneys uh, scattered worldwide. Um, my colleagues and I, um, Jason Novak, Ben Pelletier, uh, we actually form, I guess, the uh, the precision medicine and digital pra health practice group here within the firm. But really, that's kind of a misnomer. We actually our our coverage and our experience and expertise, as Miley um, alluded to earlier, really extends beyond just precision medicine and digital health. We also work with a lot of um, uh, food companies uh, on the clean foods, meat substitutes, and novel proteins side uh, to help them put together. Uh, strategies to go ahead and protect their intellectual property. Um, as fo folks on the line know, uh, there are some unique issues that uh, that exist in IP in those areas. So hopefully today we'll be able to go ahead and uh, provide you some, um, I guess, thought, food for thought and uh, guidance on how to go ahead and put protections around those innovations. And also my colleague, Roger Royce, um, he's a corporate attorney out of uh, our Palo Alto office, and he does a tremendous amount of work with startups, uh, both on the formation side, as well as uh, strategic advisory for all the stages of uh, startups, you know, from growth all the way to, to exit. Um, so uh, he's, gonna be, he's gonna be talking about those issues as well in today's talk. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much more in depth in the first couple of slides, because it's just really something you can read offline. Um, but what I will say, just to kind of, um, round up my background. My background is uh, I have an undergrad in toxicology and uh, I have a master's in, um, in, I guess, environmental engineering with an emphasis in biochemical engineering. Uh, I work with a lot of companies, again, in the, in the life sciences biotech space. Uh, and prior to being uh, going back into outside uh, practice, I was in-house counsel at Thermo Fisher Scientific, which I oversaw you know, various parts of their, th uh, their technology platforms, including the biomanufacturing group, which is kind of how, uh, you know, it kind of overlays it into this industry. With that, I'm, I'm going to turn this over to um, Jason Novak. Thanks, Roger. Um, hi, my name is Jason Novak. I'm also a partner in the San Francisco Office Intellectual Property Group. 
Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. It's a little, uh, little different background, but it, it, it may be pretty relevant to folks on the phone. Um, I actually graduated as a chemical engineer and worked in the food industry for many years as a food process engineer. Um, I developed new processes and, and revised the existing process in the areas of in, in the pourables area, which would be salad dressings, miracle whip mayonnaise, barbecue sauce, and the like. And interestingly, uh, that area uh, comes with a lot of processing uh, complexities. Uh, believe it or not, particularly in the uh, mayonnaise area, where uh, by standard of identity, uh, oil needs to be at approximately 90% of the product, but you need to form an oil and water emulsion, and and, and it creates a lot of technical issues. Uh, particularly with the expensive ingredients that are required to meet standard of identity. So it became a very interesting project. They also did a lot of work around aerating, um, aerating products to create whipped forms of those products. <laughs> a little bit of a, a little bit of a hack for you people that are shopping around the grocery store. Whenever you see whipped on a product like whipped cream cheese and they're selling at a premium price, they're actually selling you air. So just a little bit of thing to keep in mind. Uh, the ice cream industry has been doing this for years, but I did a lot of work in that space uh, in, in terms of learning how to retain uh, air and oxygen in a very, very, um, you know, in a, in a not so dense uh, environment, it became another technical difficulty. So it was very interesting work I did for years. And after a while, I left and went to law school, because I wanted to become a patent attorney. And once I graduated, moved right back into the food industry, representing companies like Wrigley, Mars, Nestle, many uh, specific entities in Nestle, including uh, Purina, uh, Waters Health Sciences, Gerber, etc. And did that for a few years before moving uh, in-house at Thermo Fisher, which is where I met Roger. And that was, that was where I transitioned from food into life sciences and represented the genetic sciences division, handling their software and systems uh, intellectual property needs for many years before uh, starting this practice and going back out with Roger. So that's a little bit about my background. Um, ben? Thanks, Jason. So Jason and I have similar backgrounds. I'm Ben Pelletier. I'm in the San Francisco office of Haynes and Boone. I recently joined the firm. My background in education is in the bioengineering field. So <clears throat> I got my bachelor's and master's degree in that field. And I worked for many years in the biotech industry, actually working at Genentech and a few smaller companies, producing at a very large scale recombinant proteins that are used for treating diseases, mostly in the area of uh, cancer, the immuno-oncology field. And so after about five or six years working at Genentech, um, I decided to go to law school, and I've been in the law firm world ever since, helping companies protect their intellectual property assets around those types of products. When I was at Genentech, I worked specifically in an area of the company that was involved with biomanufacturing, which meant growing cells that are producing these recombinant proteins, and then pulling the recombinant proteins out of the cells, purifying them using various purification streams, and then formulating them into their final drug product composition, which in the, in the case of cancer therapeutics is typically a vial with the protein that is in a formulation that keeps it stable during freeze-thaw cycles. So actually a very similar background to Jason, but in the field of therapeutics. So once I moved to the law firm world, I've helped people protect their intellectual property rights around proteins like that, but also around biomanufacturing process steps that are involved with creating these compounds. So one example of that, I've worked with companies that do genetic engineering of bacteria in one case, which was specifically to enhance oil recovery from an oil well. So they were working with bacteria that had to be genetically modified so that they could survive in the environment of an oil well but also so that they would preferentially only degrade certain hydrocarbons that were in the oil and leave the hydrocarbons that you want to produce gasoline from intact. So there's a lot of potential places where intellectual property can come from when you're working with recombinant organisms, recombinant proteins, and various methods that you use to tease those proteins out of the organisms. And a lot of that has to do or relates very directly to the meat substitutes field, because that's really what we're doing. We're creating proteins that have beneficial flavor profiles, and then we're formulating them into a food product. So the, the background that I have both technically and legally really lends well to supporting folks that are trying to innovate in this particular area. Awesome, Ben. Uh, Roger, can you go to the next slide? Great. 
So uh, given our backgrounds, uh, Ben and I are going to tackle IP protection in, in sort of a way that's that fits a little bit of our background. I'm going to talk about sort of the traditional IP protection for foods, particularly that are relevant here. There's obviously a large wealth of information on how food is protected traditionally, some of it not as so relevant to the alternative protein space, but uh, some of the areas we're going to talk about here are. And then Ben's going to talk a little bit more about more of the emerging IP protection uh, regimes that are really unique to the alternative protein sector. So. A couple of areas, focus areas, there's many focus areas of traditional IP food protection, but a couple that are relevant here that were areas of innovation and areas where a lot of these companies look to protect were in the areas of achieving a specific flavor, aroma, appearance. That's always an important aspect of, of the finished product and foods and, and how to get there has always been a source of great difficulty, uh, particularly with the uses of uh, all alternative flavors and flavor houses and whatnot uh, to being able to achieve a lot of this. And so once you're able to create that innovative product that delivers that that end game, that end product, particularly from an aroma uh, and, and flavor perspective, uh, it is areas of uh, ripe IP protection traditionally. And that can come in the form of unique ingredients, uh, synergies, unique ingredient applications, unique ingredient, uh, unique ingredient percentages, and whatnot, and and really being able to create uh, that recipe that is unique and that offers a, often very synergistic value uh, in in the finished product. And so, in terms of patenting, particularly in the composition realm. Uh, traditionally, there's areas that, that we look to focus on, uniqueness of the ingredient blends. Often, certain ing uh, many of the ingredients used in the food industry have been used for years, but often through a lot of research, certain ingredients can have synergistic value when used in specific combinations. And once those are discovered and they at really, really uh, create a, a jump in terms of the innovation in that space versus what's in the public domain, that's an area ripe for protection. Now, a lot of this comes from unexpected results uh, within the composition or process. Uh, often, a finished product um, finished product goals are not accomplished uh, through really, really strict regimes of development. They're often by mistake, and they're often by just 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 random experimentation. And so, when that often occurs, those those areas are often captured for protection. And then also taking it a step deeper into specific ingredient percentages. Um, often uh, there are there are combinations of ingredients that are used in sort of broader or at least patented in sort of a broader range of protection, not realizing there's certain specific uh, ingredient percentages within that broad range that have unique uh, unique performance that is unique from from that broad range entirely. And this has happened a lot in experimentation where you know, 10 to 20% of a certain ingredient may produce a certain value, but if you get it in between that 14 to 15%, it produces a unique value. And that unique value is different than what, what it was producing otherwise. And that's often, that often happens in the food industry and is another area right for protection. And there's certain other things that keep in mind in terms of from a protection standpoint traditionally is, is protecting, uh, in, particularly when you're talking about ingredient blends, is not, you know, not reciting specific types of ingredients, but more categories of ingredients. Often these category of ingredients can all have similar performances, though certain ones are better than others. Uh, we always look to protect categories of ingredients, particularly when used in combinations with others. And then finally, and really relevant uh, to, uh, really also very relevant to the food, uh, to the alternative protein industry is patenting product appearance. And, and traditionally, when we're looking at layers or striations or stable emulsions or things like that, uh, that appearance in a finished product is something that's very important in the food industry because often um, purchasing food or, or, or customers purchases of food are a lot based upon what they see. It's what's, what the appearance is like perfecting that swirl in an ice cream, having the right layering on a chewing gum, those things matter to a consumer. So if you're able to accomplish that, that perfect product appearance you're looking to, uh, to get to, that's often an area where you wanna protect because that is really what often companies use as a source identifier. It's almost like a trademark. Like I see this product appearance, I know it's this company, very important area for protection. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna transfer over to Ben to talk a little bit more about uh, emerging IP protection in foods. Next slide, Roger. Thanks, Jason. So as I was mentioning earlier, with the in the field of meat substitutes, there are various things that we're doing to create the product. The first and probably most important is the protein itself. So what we're doing is we're creating proteins that have desirable flavor profiles. Oftentimes, these are proteins that bind to metal ions like iron 
and they impart that meaty flavor when you eat the product. Um, so this requires oftentimes genetically engineering the protein or altering its genetic profile so that when it is made in a host cell, it will bind to more iron molecules or fewer iron molecules and impart the desired flavor profile on the final product. So anytime you are altering a protein or you're engaging in protein engineering, that's an area where we can get a patent for you, where we can protect your intellectual property rights if you invent something new. In addition to that, we have the host cells and the organisms that are used to produce these proteins. So these could be mammalian cells or they could be microbial cells. Oftentimes when you are working with host cells like this, you have expression vectors and techniques that are involved in getting the cells to produce the protein. And so if you're experimenting with that using different types of expression vectors or altering an expression vector in a way to get the cells to produce the protein at higher levels, that's another area where we can pursue patent protection. There's also, with respect to the host organisms themselves, oftentimes we use what are called extremophiles, which are organisms that grow in difficult conditions like high salinity or high temperature conditions. And we're looking for organisms that can still create the proteins we want with suitable quality under those harsher conditions. So sometimes this involves genetically engineering the organism in other ways, aside from the protein that they produce, so that they can survive under the manufacturing conditions and they can produce the product. That's another area for IP protection. If you're engaging in that sort of thing, trying to work with a host organism to get it to produce what you want it to produce under difficult conditions, that's definitely an area to look at for intellectual property protection. And then looking at the bioprocess manufacturing stream as a whole, we have the upstream process, which is when the cells are actually grown and they're producing the protein. This is when the, the host organism is still alive. And then we have downstream processing, which is once the product has been produced, we're killing off the host cell or separating the protein from the host cell using things like centrifugation, chromatography, filtration, those types of unit operations. So there are, there are things that may happen to the product during that period, or perhaps there's a step where we're adding iron back to the protein to get it to bind onto those iron binding sites. And those are methods that you can patent as well. If there's some way that you're treating the protein either upstream or downstream that is not naturally occurring, that's an area for intellectual property protection. And then finally, and this is especially important in the food business, as Jason was saying earlier, oftentimes there are visible attributes or um, texture-based attributes of the final product that you want. And in the, in the world of meat substitutes, you're often starting with a dry mixture or a wet mixture of the protein in bulk. And then you're gonna be processing it in some way to make it mimic a meat product. So here I've, I have an example of a process flow where a dry mixture of protein is fed in one end and then it's extruded through this device to create muscle-like chunks of a final product so that you could mimic the composition of say shredded pork or shredded chicken. So there's a lot of good opportunities around this type of step for intellectual property protection as well because oftentimes this is a brand new field, right? People have not really been working in the, in the world of meat substitutes. People have not really been working with altered proteins and then processing them to contain attributes like striated fibers that mimic a muscle or any sort of appearance that gives it some kind of textural feel when you eat it. So unlike the food industry where we're looking at, usually looking at pretty small incremental increases in technology there, here we're looking at for the first time, oftentimes working with one of these proteins and trying to impart some kind of textural feel or look or appearance that would make it desirable as a food product. So that's an area as well where we wanna look for intellectual property. Next slide, Roger. So I wanna talk a little bit now about patent versus trade secret protection. This is always a tension in the world of intellectual property. And that's because 
A patent is a very public document. You have to disclose to the world what you've done. And in exchange for that, you get a limited period of a monopoly, typically 20 years. In contrast, a trade secret doesn't have a term associated with it, but you have to keep the information secret and not tell the public about it. So in the world of proteins, the issue is it can be difficult to keep something secret because someone could simply buy your meat substitute hamburger and sequence the proteins in it and discover the sequence of your protein. And then suddenly your trade secret is gone because it's been discovered. So we want to use trade secret protection only when reverse engineering is really difficult or impossible. And the prime example of that is the recipe for Coca-Cola. It's one of the most famous trade secrets, right? You can buy a Coca-Cola, but you can't really figure out exactly what's in it. And that's not necessarily the case for a protein product because someone can easily sequence the protein and figure out what its amino acid structure is. So there's no limit on trade secrets, but you have to carefully protect them. They can also somewhat limiting your li limit your licensing revenue because oftentimes once you start getting into a license agreement where you can protect a trade secret from being publicly disclosed, but the more people who know about it, the more likelihood there is that the trade secret's going to get out. Um, and so you want to be careful when you talk about licensing a trade secret because you're sort of handing someone your secret recipe and you're hoping that they keep it secret. So for meat substitutes, patent protection is the preferred way to go because proteins and large molecules are really easy to reverse engineer. When you get into the area of host cells, expression systems, and bioprocess manufacturing steps, these can be more difficult to reverse engineer and they're typically kept on company property. So they're a little bit more amenable to trade secret protection, but you have to be careful because that trade secret protection can be a little bit more difficult to, you know, to handle with care under licensing situations. And also we've got employee mobility issues that can complicate trade secret protection. Oftentimes, especially where we are in Silicon Valley, employees move around quite a bit and trade secret protection can be very problematic when certain people know how the work is done and then they move to another company. And there's really, it's really becomes difficult to control that trade secret and make sure it doesn't get out. So, we always want to be cognizant of the tension between these two and look carefully at opportunities for applying one or the other, given the type of intellectual property that's involved. And Ben, I, I'd add, you know, I also had another uh, characteristic about trade secret protection, particularly in, in life sciences, where you know it's a it's a really traditionally a heavy public a publication. Uh, industry where researchers, once they discover something, want to publicize on it, whether whether it be sort of on the on front end product, you know, customer facing end, or even on the bioprocessing side. And so that's another thing for folks to keep in mind is when we're operating in a very much of a sort of a public publication um, type industry where that's really a focus that patent protection may even become even more important based upon the fact that you're going to naturally have more disclosed about your technology. Right, exactly. One more thing I would add here as well is that, you know, one is with trade secret protection, once this, once the secret formula or the, uh, uh, is out, the damage is done. Um, it's not like it's, it's a situation where basically that you're, you're limited to seeking damages from the person who actually misappropriated and leaked it. If that individual or that company is not around anymore, you're, you're, uh, you're, I guess your, uh, recourse for, uh, for restitution is actually limited. Um, it's not like patent protection, which again, um, lasts the entire term that 20 years that you get, um, regardless of whether or not one of your, one of your employees or someone else leaks, leaks the secret formula out, you can still actually enforce it, right? So um, you, you have this ongoing right to go ahead and exclude others from sell, making, using, and selling within the space. Yep, and it's it's really hard to calculate enough damages to offset the loss of, of a trade secret that is valuable enough for you to keep under lock and key. Uh, the impact to your company will go on forever. And so, yeah, there's, it's hard to really calculate any damages that can make up for that. Um, so, yep, that's, uh, so for folks on the phone, that is uh, the uh, our IP protection discussion. Um, I think uh, we want to just move right into the, the, the corporate discussion next. Yeah, I, I want to make one quick comment here. Um, we're going to have some time at the end of this presentation to address some questions. We're seeing it come through the chat line right now. So uh, just 
hold tight. We'll, we'll definitely draw, I think, have some time to address your questions later on in this presentation. Okay, well, thanks. My name is Roger Royce. I'm a corporate and tax partner with Haynes and Boone, located in Palo Alto office. Uh, I'm not an IP lawyer, so I'm not going to talk about IP issues. I will talk about some of the corporate issues that I regularly deal with. So I come to the area a little bit differently, and I'm going to drop into the chat box a couple of links so you can see who I am. Um, but as well as uh, doing corporate and tax law, I've also formed a group here about 10 years ago around agriculture technology. And some of the big players in your industry got their first look at the public standing on the stage of the Silicon Valley Ag Tech Conference, which I created and we've done every year for about the past eight or 10 years now. Um, so I've seen a lot of, of these companies. And what I do tends to be a, a little bit industry agnostic, of course. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is maybe a little more general, uh, but still important to, to any, any companies developing this or any other technology. Could uh, go to the next slide, please. Yeah, we can jump that. Um, so most of the companies I work with tend to be early stage. Uh, there certainly is a lot of innovation in the space. I don't have to tell you that. And here in Silicon Valley, where I work and live and practice, uh, innovation usually means emerging growth and startup. Uh, and this valley, of course, is built on equity ownership. Uh, and that's where we usually start is compensating service providers. And the companies I work with, uh, typically do that through restricted stock. Uh, that means that basically it's sweat equity. People work for stock. If they stop working, they give up their unvested shares. Very common options, of course, option plans. A typical cap table will not only have restricted stock, it will also have an option, which is merely a right to buy stock in a company. For about the last 15 years, that right has had to been, has to be exercised at current fair market value of the stock. We're seeing a lot of what we call phantom unit plans and phantom units, uh, even in the startup world, which is a contractual right that mimics stock, but is not actually stock. It's not a, it's not a security under our, Cal at least here in California, under our regulatory laws, it could end up being a security depending on how it's used. Uh, it is more of an uh, unsecured contractual agreement to pay something that looks a lot like stock and then RSUs, which is something you might have heard a lot about uh, over the last few years, since a lot of big tech companies have been using RSUs, that's restricted stock units. And the nature of a restricted stock unit is unlike restricted stock, where a stock is issued to somebody up front, and then you earn into it, meaning that if you leave, you have to give your unvested shares back. With an RSU, as you vest, those shares are granted to you. Hardly ever do I see them in emerging growth and startup companies. I spend more time talking people out of them than actually doing them uh, because for non-liquid stock, you know, it's, it's not really a great tax result to get these non-liquid pieces of paper that result in a large tax liability. For bigger companies, companies that have a lively secondary trading market or are public, uh, they're a lot more popular. And of course, this is the kind of industry where you have companies in both spaces. Next slide, please. Let me talk a little bit about vesting because, uh, and I won't spend too much more time on this because we've touched on this, but the concept of vesting, as I said, it's sweat equity. It's earning into the shares that have been granted uh, in your company. Uh, and usually sometimes people refer to it as reverse vesting because the concept is shares are granted up front, but then if somebody leaves, terminates their employment with a company, whatever shares are unvested have to be returned to the company at cost, which is usually very nominal. So under a three-year vesting period, if somebody works for a year and then leaves, they keep a third of their shares, they return two thirds. You might've heard of the concept of triggers, um, often requested, sometimes granted. A uh, single trigger means either of these two events would result in accelerated vesting, maybe 100% accelerated vesting. And, and here's the concept, you might say, look, uh, we sold this company before my four-year vesting period was up. Um, I should get credit for that, right? You should vest me fully and I should be 100% vested in the proceeds of that sale. That's a change of control acceleration. 
Uh, another concept is termination of service. And the idea is, well, look, there's three founders and two of you ganged up on me and you, you kicked me out of the company without cause. That's not my fault. I should get full vesting. Either one of those is what we call a single trigger. Um, I used to be able to slip those past the VCs. Uh, not, not anymore, no longer. Uh, rarely, if ever, will you see a single trigger, which you will see for higher level and executive, executive people, very important people to the company if what we call a double trigger. If both of those things happen within say a six month period or maybe a year, then the party gets accelerated, partial or full acceleration of vesting, meaning they get all their shares immediately vested. And the idea is look, if the company gets sold and then I get terminated because of that sale, because I'm redundant, you know, I'm the CFO and acquirer doesn't need another one of those, uh, that really isn't my fault and I should get a little bit more credit. Um, <clears throat> these other concepts are technical tax things. I don't want to go into that too much here. Just understand that this is tricky stuff. Uh, it has enormous tax implications. Uh, don't try this at home, folks, uh, if you've got vesting restrictions. And by the way, if you're on the other side of that, if you're the service provider getting the stock subject to vesting, you have some tax obligations. There are filings you have to make, and that's totally on you. And if you don't, you're going to have a big surprise when you go see your accountant uh, next April 15. Uh, and sometimes these issues arise very subtly because vesting gets imposed on a financing. Sometimes it gets imposed on an M&A transaction. The acquirer wants to put new handcuffs on people. Uh, just be sensitive to the fact that there are tax implications and it's your obligation. Next slide, please. Um, in, so I do wanna let you know that shares are always subject to transfer restrictions. One that you might've heard a lot about, the ROFR, the right of first refusal. And as companies mature, this becomes more and more important. And, uh, and especially in this industry, as companies are starting to get you know, big and well-known and um, what 10 years ago, uh, uh, it, it's kind of surprising that you know, the, the people that used to sit next to me on panels 10 years ago are now like celebrities in this world because their companies have done so well. And, and, and that means people want to get liquidity because a lot of them are not public yet. So they want to go sell their shares to a private, to a private party. Uh, a company will almost always have a right of first refusal. And the idea behind a right of first refusal is to make it really difficult uh, for somebody to make that sale. And we can't absolutely restrict someone from selling their shares, but we can make it hard. And we make it hard by saying that the, they have to offer you, the seller have to offer your shares back to the company before you can sell it to a third party. Just keep in mind, your shares are almost always subject to that. And when that happens, there's a couple different options. One, you can get the company to waive it. If they don't, um, you just comply. You say, look, company, I've got an offer for the sale of my shares. You can have them if you want, and the price is X. Hard to get an offer when there is a offer that the company might exercise because what buyer wants to go to all that trouble of making an offer and doing their diligence if they're not going to not going to have the opportunity. You know, oftentimes they'll we'll negotiate carve outs to the rover uh, for individual people and say, look, we'll give you the right to sell a small amount of your shares without sending them back to the company. These other rights tend to lockups. That means that uh, if the investment bankers require it, which they always will. Uh, a party won't sell their shares into the public markets within six months of an IPO. We always see that. Uh, and then the rest of these are more in the nature of rights that investors impose on shares when they invest in a company. Co-sale rights means that if you sell your shares, you have to let your investor participate in that sale and get a little liquidity, drag along. It's just the flip side of that. The investor finds a buyer that wants all of the shares, not just the investor, the you know, founders, the people who are subject to the drag, they have to offer their shares on that sale. Uh, I won't talk about my sale. We could be here for a long time. And then rule 144, keep in mind there are securities related restrictions on resales of shares, uh, but we can usually find a good exception to that. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> So capitalization, uh, again, I work mostly with emerging growth. So I'll just let you know that um, in the corporate world, one of the first things we're going to confront, especially here in, in the Valley where I am, is companies will get formed and they'll immediately go out for funding or very soon after. And they'll do that in stages. Um, the first money in is usually through a convertible note. 
uh, a safe in California, convertible note in other parts of the country, it seems. And the concept between both of these is that the investor is putting money into the company up front, but taking their equity later. And the, the, the stated reason for doing that is usually because you can't value the company up front. It's just too early. It's too soon. So, uh, but the company needs the money now. So it's sort of like, we'll take the money now. We'll give you the stock later when we know what the company is worth. And there are a, as you can imagine, there are a lot of intricacies uh, to how these work. At what price are they getting in later? Um, you know, when, how much time do they have? What if you don't do a financing? What if you sell the company instead? All of this gets dealt with in the safe. The good news is, is that the market is very, very efficient. And there are a lot of these instruments out there. That's also the bad news because a lot of companies can go out very easily and download a form from some very popular websites. And I'll just warn you, if you are a company, uh, if you're a startup company doing this, um, don't go download a form from the internet and use it because the most popular forms floating around are very, very, very investor friendly. I'll leave it at that. Um, uh, we could talk a lot as to why that is, uh, but I'll just tell you, this is not a place where you should where you should do do it yourself brain surgery. So com sometimes companies, they do want to set a value for the company and they'll just do an equity round or what we call a priced round. And that will be almost always what we call preferred stock, series seed preferred if it's early. And uh, there's a lot of psychology in this because a company wants to be at a certain stage before it calls the stock that it's selling to investors series A. They might not be at that stage yet. They might not have traction right? Um, or they might not be scalable. So those are usually the buzzwords that we see in the venture world, but they need the money and they want to do a priced round. So we do something intermediate we call series seed preferred. It's preferred stock. The investor is getting in at a certain valuation and are getting rights and preferences. We're just not going to call it series A. Um, and then series A is the full blown priced round with all the bells and whistles, rights, preferences, Usually that happens when we have institutions investing, meaning venture capitalists. And I could spend hours talking about that, and I have, and if you click on my links, you can listen to it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you know, I, for everybody, startup or not, I do wanna just pause on some employee issues that affect your industry and every other industry uh, these days. Um, misclassification is one you've heard a lot about. And, and I'll spare you the history. Let me just tell you where we are right now. Uh, if you're in a state like California or Massachusetts or, or possibly some other states that I don't know about yet, um, there's a much uh, more strict rule on who is classified properly as an employee and who's a contractor. And these rules were designed to affect the gig economy uh, because it was believed that gig economy workers weren't getting the protections of the labor law that they were entitled to in particular um, uh, uh, some of the labor law protections and tax, uh, payroll taxes and workers' compensation in particular. So the law has really tightened up uh, state by state in some states like California. And California is very restrictive. And we have seen the result of that in California, especially in the gig economy. Uh, what I guess I'd like to caution all of you now is that there is a move afoot to make California's law the law of the, of the nation, the law of the land throughout the nation. Uh, the Biden administration has embraced the California rule and there has been a bill introduced in the Senate quite a while ago now, uh, it's still you know, popping around. There are, uh, the president has bigger things to think about today anyway, but this will come back up and our labor department has taken a much more aggressive approach on enforcement. What does that mean for you? It means that the person that you might think is a contractor that you're given a 1099 to might not be a contractor for tax purposes, might be an employee for tax and employment law purposes. That has a whole lot of implications. Um, the other thing I'd, I'd, le I'd like to let you know is that uh, a lot of provisions in these contracts that protect the company's rights into what the employee does uh, are subject to state law and state regulation. Non-competes here in California are effectively not, a, you know, they're just not enforceable um, unless they're tied to the sale of goodwill of a business. And that can be a whole discussion in itself. But just keep in mind, depending on what state you're in, you might have a problem with non-competes, even non-solicits uh, and no hire agreements. Uh, so we have to be careful about that. 
Uh, this is an IP presentation, so I'll just mention that companies, the companies I work with, their most valuable asset, I know Roger and Jason probably don't want to hear this, but their most valuable asset is not patent, uh, it's trade secret. And they need to go way out of their way to protect their trade secrets. And we do that, first of all, through NDAs and good contracts and good processes. And of course, here in California, we encourage employee mobility, other states may too. Uh, so it's, it's pretty hard uh, to keep a, a person from developing something on their own time and their own facilities and going out and starting a new company. Next slide, please. You know, I got to tell you, I'm at about 50 minutes. We've got a lot of good questions here. I think we ought to just turn it over uh, to the questions and answer now, if that's okay with you guys. Sure, absolutely. Okay. Great. That sounds good to me. Um, so thank you to all of our speakers for that insanely value-packed presentation. Um, and so if any folks were taking notes, don't worry, you'll get the recording and slides emailed to you, as I mentioned, so you can reference again and again. Um, so now we'll turn it over to an audience Q&A, um, have a few questions in the Q&A box here. So just a reminder to please submit questions in the Q&A box uh, uh, rather than the chat. I'd like to add one quick thing. Like uh, as I alluded earlier, we're gonna have office hours um, as we're continuing to sign up for office hours. So basically this will be like a, um, a 30 minute non-confidential non consultation with uh, one of us, right? to talk about some of these issues, even especially if you have questions you don't feel comfortable asking in this forum right now. I provided the link here and I believe um, GFI has that link up on their website as well, uh, or it should be on, if not, it should be on the slides. So even if you don't get your questions answered right now, make sure um, you realize that you have an opportunity to do so later. We'll be signing up for those. Thank you, Roger. And yeah, that link will go out in the um, post webinar email along with the recording and um, the slides. Just got a question about that. So all of that information will be in the email. Um, so going on to the first question for plant based companies, what type of IP protection is most attractive to VC investors? I'll, I'll take a first crack at this. Um, you know, really, it's the type and form of IP protection you want for your company is there's no, how to say, uh, standard uh, template for it. It really depends a lot of the considerations that Jason and Ben touched on earlier, right? Um, it depends on, again, what, how we produce for reverse engineer or where all the, the, the invention is. If it's something that's uh, very hard to reverse engineer or hard to independently develop, um, trade secret protection could be one of those areas, uh, could be something that's, uh, I guess, more preferable. Uh, with something a little more along the lines of something that you can see someone else independently developing or, or engineering themselves, patent protection tends to be kind of uh, full, getting in the mix. But the critical piece right here really for investors is that you have to have a plan. That's really what it comes down to and a story behind what you're doing. Uh, you shouldn't be walking into these conversations with investors uh, without saying, well, we kind of thought about this, we kind of thought about that. We didn't do patents because it was, you know, costly or whatever it is. The, 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 read, the rationale may be, it's best that you have an idea, uh, that you have rationale behind the approach that you've taken and chosen. And also one quick thing about trade secret protection, I'm not sure we covered earlier, is that trade secret protection also requires some active steps on the part of the company. It's not like you just, you avail yourself to trade secret just by default. Um, you have to, for example, mark um, documentation materials that you consider your trade secret, to be your trade secret, confidential. You actually have to have an active uh, uh, you know, program to do so, to do that marking. Also, um, pursuant to that is that you actually also have to have a, some sort of policy or some sort of internal training that you're providing your employees, again, to show that you're taking, quote unquote, active measures to protect your trade secrets. So if, you're, if you do not have those plans together and you do not uh, follow, um, I guess, uh, do not have that, that, that uh, habit of marking your materials confidential, that could be a defense, right, um, to trade secret misappropriation because one of your employees can just say, I did not know this, this materials I'm revealing later on is confidential or trade secret. Um, yeah, Jason, I'll just add one more, I'll add one more thing to this question in what type of IP protection is sophisticated. And, and that means it's got, it, it has to be broad. It has to take into consideration what your product platform is. 
And it's a combination of protecting your assets locally and internationally, but also smartly and discreetly. So spending your money well, having a plan for where you're going to protect and why, looking at trademarks as well as patents and trade secrets in the food industry, source identifier is very important. So there's a lot of branding that's involved. So protecting phrases, protecting logos, protecting names also is an additional thing that's always gonna be important in the food industry. Let me weigh in with just one quick comment, if you don't mind. I, I, um, since I do, you know, I do a lot of, I'm not an IP lawyer, but I do a lot of work with, with VCs and that strategic part is super important. So VCs, they need an exit. They're thinking exit. And on, on average, it's going to be in about five years. So it's a typical VC fund will be seven or eight years plus a few extensions. So let's say on average. So they're thinking about an exit at the moment they put their money in. And as an IP matter, what that means is that you've got IP that's going to be very attractive to your world of potential acquirers. And some of the patent lawyers uh, that I know that work in the space will oftentimes craft their claims and create their strategies as if they're writing for that potential acquirer. So I think, you know, I think strategy is really important here. If you're a VC fundable type company. Great. Thank you. Um, so next question here, how does freedom to operate affect your decision to pursue patents versus trade secrets? And there seems to be less recourse if you're a small company, if you patent something novel and can't pursue damages. So anything you can say about that? Well, uh, you know, I, I think we've, we've got a little bit of a mix of concepts there. <laughs> First of all, I mean, um, freedom to operate really isn't a, doesn't have anything to do with, I guess, directly to do with trade secrets. Right. So, I mean, freedom operates is just really basically whether or not you can go ahead and sell, make you just sell your product uh, by violating someone else's IP, mainly patents, trademarks and copyrights. Right. So that's just kind of separate that that issue from 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 each other. Um, and it, it, you know, in terms of, you know, the recourse you have to small companies, honestly, if you got you have good patent protection. Right. The size of the company shouldn't matter. On enforcement, there are David, David and Goliath issue, uh, lawsuits all the time. Uh, so if you have very good patents around what you're doing, and you've got a Goliath like I'll just you know make something up, ADM uh, make uh, you know making and using uh, I guess the invention that you've patented. Um, just because you're much smaller than ADM, they have a lot more financial muscle. Doesn't make the value of that patent any less. You absolutely can find law firms who will, who will um, do do cases on contingency to go ahead and go after these guys. Um, I'll use a perfect example of how, how that, how extensive that is. Um, very early on in my career, I worked on a litigation called, it was a data treasury corporation against all the banks in the United States. DTC was a, um, was really a sole inventor uh, of the check processing systems. Um, and he just fought, basically filed a whole host of patents around how we clear checks throughout the country. Very small player. Two, I think it was a four or five man shop. He won against every single major bank in the United States. And by the time he was done, his patents uh, garnered almost four or five hundred million dollars in in, uh, in damages. So that'll give you an idea that it really doesn't make, really matter. Yeah, and, and I'll just add to that that the that the FTO or freedom to operate versus patenting question has uh, existed has has often been an issue with folks to understand it's a fundamental issue and so if if what we're talking about doesn't under, uh, doesn't make sense fundamentally this is a good reason to sign up for office hours because it, it does understanding this as a company is important in, in really trying to define an ip strategy you fundamentally have to understand this difference because uh quite honestly investors don't understand the difference at times and they'll ask, they'll ask during a series A for an FTO on a product that's yet to be developed and because they don't understand what it means. So it, it's important for you as particularly you as entrepreneurs to understand the difference between FTO, which is defensive protection versus offensive patenting and to fundamentally get that. So it's tough to answer that question in five minutes because it is really fundamental uh, to uh, understanding offensive defensive IP strategy. So please do consider you know, following up, signing up for office hours because you, you may need a little bit more time to understand it. Thanks. Um, so here's a great question. There's so many companies in the all protein space who are working with co-manufacturers. So a question here about how to protect trade secrets when working with co-manufacturers. Uh, I, I can take a stab at that one. I was just going to say, 
um, as Roger had noted in some of the, the chat comments, you know, you can protect aspects of your trade secrets with NDAs, putting out there a contract that says you're not going to disclose this information. But the other thing is to just make sure you're limiting the knowledge of the trade secret only to those who need to know. So if you're working with a co-manufacturer and you have a special media that you're using, then you don't tell them the recipe. You say, we're going to supply this media and you're going to use it and you're not going to reverse engineer it or figure out what's in it, right? So there are various ways that you can go about that. And then in addition, marking things as confidential, there are various aspects of a trade secret protection system that always have to be in place. So it's those two things together, limiting the access to information to only those who need to know and then making sure that the correct protections are being taken when someone does need to know about it. Um, I'll, I'll add a couple. Oh. I'm sorry, go ahead, Tim. Just yeah, I'll add a couple, a couple, just based on sort of personal experience in, in dealing with this issue in the food industry, a couple of things that, that can be taken into consideration is sort of the, the uh, Coman stance. Some Comans have no IP portfolio. Some have an extensive one. It's something to keep in mind. Why does a co-man have an extensive IP portfolio? Because they have their own independent interests. So that may be something you keep in mind in terms of comparing co-mans in terms of which ones you want to move forward with. Another one is understanding sort of the, infra, the, the inside structure of the, of the plant or manufacturing facility in terms of exposure of multiple companies to the same production room. Um, because really, honestly, you can try to deal with your co-man in terms of your interaction, but we're, we're, how are third parties sniffing around? How, how much is access limited? Because you have to understand these are co-mans, which means they're producing a lot of the same products, which means your competitors are using that co-man as well. So understanding you know, where, you know, where you're going to be positioned, where third parties are positioned accordingly, whether it be from a scheduling standpoint, whether it be from a location standpoint, those things sort of from a logistical standpoint are very important and are considered by folks who are engaging with comments. Yeah, but one more thing I want to add, and I mentioned this earlier, right? There is no perfect protection using using contractual terms to protect that. Um, that's the issue, right? Because your your damages are limited to either the employee who's who's misappropriating your your trade secret or the company that, which he or she uh, mis, um, benefited uh, with that trade secret. Um, if that company is not a large one or that employee is not wealthy, again, once your trade secret's released to the public. Uh, your recourse is very limited. Again, that's the problem with trade secrets is that it doesn't, uh, it, it's limited in that area. It's not like patent protection. Once it gets out in the public, uh, you're dead in the water. Patent protection is not that. It, it could be up in the public. It could be, you know, notorious. It could be in, in explicit detail. But for that 20 year period that you have patent protection, you have absolute monopoly uh, around that formulation, around that product, you know, whatever's uh, covered in that, under that patent claim. So be very aware of that. You will learn with IP protection and all the different types of IP protection. You, you don't get your cake and eat it too. You, yeah. You're going to get something, but you're going to lose something in, 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 as a result. You know, with, with, with patent protection, yeah, you're going to spend a lot of money, but you're going to have exclusivity for a certain period of time. Trade, trade secrets, you don't have to pay a dime, obviously, in, uh, beyond internal structure in terms of how you organize that information. Um, and you could have that trade secret for 100 years. But if it walks out, you can't reclaim that, that loss. I mean, no, no matter what lawsuit you go through, you can't reclaim it. So it's your, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You may get 100 years of protection, but for any reason, if it walks out that door, whether or not you can sue someone or not, the value loss, Coca-Cola could never get back value if that yeah. Coca-Cola formula walked out the door. They could sue for billions and billions. The loss just keeps piling and piling and, on top of itself. And that's why the elaborate um, protections that Coca-Cola puts around their, their, their formulas. I and mean, there's no joke. They split their formula up amongst multiple individuals. No one, it never sits in one place, right? In terms of uh, one, one set of hands. So uh, very interesting how they do it. Um, thanks everyone. So another um, related question, someone asked if you're a small startup and start licensing your technology to a large brand, how to protect your trade secrets in that case. I'm sure, you know, many of the strategies you just outlined would apply there too. Is there anything you would add or anything that would be different about this case? I mean, the, the, the biggest thing that you're going to have on the, as a small company side is that um, they're going to try to push you around uh, in those negotiations, right? So, I mean, the advice is, especially if you have something that's, that's very valuable, that is commercially very valuable. Um, I know it's kind of a little self-serving to say this, but you really want good counsel on your side that's advocating for the important points that you need out of that license agreement. I can't stress that enough, right? Because they're going to push you. They're going to push you on things that... Um, uh, that are important to them because they know because uh, internally they have they have they have attorneys that have done these negotiations you know 50 to 100 times before 
So if you're, if you're trying to negotiate these agreements on your own, you're not even going to recognize what you're giving up, right? So um, very critical that you get competent counsel on your side who know where the pain points are. Here's a good uh, example of when you think things, uh, how to quick check on how you know things are kind of awry. If they're saying yes to everything you're demanding uh, in the in negotiations, there is a problem. There's an immediate problem, right? Because like, either <laughs> you're missing something, what you're asking for, right? Or you're not, or, or they've got something on you in that agreement that you're not understanding. Um, I can tell you, I, I just, I'm in the middle of one right now, negotiation, where I think it, before I was brought in, uh, the, I think the founder of the company told me, well, they said yes to everything, super positive about every single aspect of that negotiation. I got involved, I looked at the stuff and they were giving up the, they were essentially giving up the, uh, the franchise and that agreement, right? And when I pushed back on two terms, um, the immediate response on the other side was, well, those are deal breakers for us, we can't do it. I mean, it was just very abrupt, right? Type of, type of change in tone, because again, it wasn't something that uh, we're asking for something that was important to the deal uh, that was very one-sided as it was drafted. And they noticed that we got, we knew what we we're talking about uh, and what we're asking for. And then immediately you see that recoil. Roger. Um, so next question here, what is the level of difficulty in terms of time and expense um, and any other considerations to obtain an international patent versus a US patent? Great question. So Go ahead, I, guess. I could jump on that one. So there, there really isn't such thing as an international patent. There's something called an international patent application. It's also referred to as a PCT application from the Patent Cooperation Treaty. And it's a procedural mechanism that you can use to obtain patents in multiple jurisdictions. So patents are jurisdictional in nature. You have to apply, apply for them in each country where you want protection. So from a procedural standpoint, if you just want a patent in the US, it makes sense to just apply in the US. If you know that you want protection in more than about two countries, it's the value proposition is better to go after a PCT filing because you pay one fee and you can enter a huge number of countries that participate in that treaty. So it's really about establishing your intellectual property strategy and understanding where you need the protection and then pursuing the procedural steps that are gonna make the most sense from a monetary perspective based on your resources. Thanks, Ben. Um, so those are all the questions we will have time for today. Um, but if you do have more questions and for folks whose questions we didn't have time to answer, our presenters again have offered to run an office hours program to answer questions after the presentation. Um, so you can find the link for that in the follow-up email as well as the chat. Um, so thank you again to our presenters for sharing your time and expertise with us. I certainly learned a lot. Um, and just a reminder to attendees that our next Business of Alt Protein seminar will be on July 16th at 12 p.m. Eastern time. And we'll be joined by John Ellersick of Next Run Technology to discuss how to use techno-economic models as a foundation for commercialization. I look forward to seeing you next month and have a great day, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye, thanks.